then, 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 I'm gonna, then I want you to give you your history. Okay. Uh, Alright. I'm Mike Hideous. I'm from a band called The Empire Hideous. Okay. Do you want a history of the band, so to speak? Yes. I started Empire Hideous in uh, around 1988, and um, I went through about 10 years of uh, doing hard gothic rock, dark music, and um, uh, eventually, after years, I, I joined up with the Misfits in 98. Uh, I also did another project called uh, the Bronx Casket Company in 99, and currently. And I also started another band in 99 uh, called Spy Society 99. Um, all four bands were very, very different from each other. Empire Hideous was the dark, heavy, gothic rock. The Misfits were, you know, legendary punk band. <clears throat> and um, the Bumps Casket Company is more of a typo negative, Black Sabbath sounding type Balls to your mother. <laughs> Cut! Cut. <laughs> A new king to reign and the king of pain. I need to know. I started Empire Hideous back in 1988. Um, uh, just basically, I had no idea what I was doing. I started writing music uh, with a friend of mine, and eventually, before I knew it, the band picked up, and we were doing club shows and recording records and CDs and tapes and doing videos and all that. And um, it went on for 10 years until uh, 98. Um, you know, and in between, we had a real successful uh, turnaround with, with uh, our, our fan base, uh, New York, New Jersey, Philly area. And um, people really picked up on it. And, you know, it was, it was good for what it was. And, I'm happy for the things that we did, although I wish we had a, a better budget where I could have recorded more quality recordings and front of and it was, it was something that I really never had. I never had the financial backing by any record label. It was always, you know, DIY, um, which, you know, I still, I still did it, though. Um, Despite the fact that I never had any financial backing or record label uh, back me up, I did everything from booking the shows, writing the songs, uh, printing the t-shirts, printing the stickers, printing out f pamphlets for shows, uh, promoting, passing out flyers. I did it all. And uh, unfortunately, the, the band had come to its demise in, in 98 um, for some internal, personal band member problems. and. Um, it disbanded. <laughs> so, I, uh, I got a call from Jerry Only, the bass player, and uh, we had known each other for a good 10, 10, 11 years before that very moment. And um, he asked me if I wanted to go on tour with him. And I had nothing going on, so I said yes, uh, as uh, any, anybody would have, uh, I'm sure. Um, and uh, before I knew it, you know, I was on a plane to Scotland, and uh, we toured all of Europe, pretty much most of Europe. Um, and we came back for a couple weeks to South America, and um, yeah, it was a really good run. Uh, it was a very good learning experience. Uh, as well as a career, ex uh, an exposure for my career as a musician. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that the things that happened did. Uh, I wish I could have changed a lot of it, but unfortunately, you know, what's done is done. And uh, unfortunately, no, none of the record labels picked up on it. I don't know why. But uh, we played a bunch of shows. We recorded an album, although we never released it to the public. Um, it, there was a four-song demo that was available, but we didn't mass produce it. But there was a full-length album called Die Punk Die. Uh, we never we never released it though. 
uh, again, all the music was upbeat tempo, and the songs were about. The, I never really lost my edge in writing lyrics. Um, I didn't sell out, so to speak. I still, I, I stayed very dark, and wrote about like killing your girlfriend and uh, um, you know the overthrow of the government and you know SS USA. Uh, you know, it was just like a really fun, fun project. I loved the band. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was a great concept. Fortunately, I don't think anybody else did. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'll never really know for sure. We had to put it on the back burner because that's um, around, the around the end of the Spy Society uh, uh, circle. Uh, a new circle began, and that was the rejuvenation of Empire Hideous again with a whole new lineup. Um, and as we started getting busy with Empire Hideous, uh, SS-99 was put on the back burner and eventually just completely taken off the back burner and put on the shelf for good because we just didn't know if uh, we'd ever do it again. It was just too busy. Empire Hideous started picking up again, so I put SS-99 on the shelf. How did you hook up with them anyway? The, uh... Got a phone call after Empire Hideous and they wanted me to do a record. It's like all these three bands Spy Society, Hideous, and Mis uh, Spy Society, Bronx Casting Company, and Misfits kind of, it was like, it, it all happened together at the same time. I'll tell you that on the film. Because <laughs> if I tell you now, it's like... I, I, I was intrigued really for a second there. <laughs> um, okay, uh, let me think. Anything? Are we doing Bronx? After Hideous had broken up, uh, hang on a second. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind if he gets in the picture? Absolutely not. <laughs> Who had some, uh, He's in one of your other videos, or what a cat is. Yeah. Is that him that is in the video? Huh? That video we saw today? I hate you were pressing the cat. Like in the phone call. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta sit up like though, if you wanna be in the video, <laughs> like you have hideous. to look cool. Oh, Empire Hideous, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta be good. That, I was just hanging out with that guy last night. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he moved to Norway. Um, he got married and moved to Norway. And uh, so he just came back to, to hang out. And uh, I saw him yesterday, we had a good time. I wasn't feeling too good though after, after a while. <laughs> drinking That's too what it's all about. Okay, are you ready? Absolutely ready and kind of ready. Um, after Empire Hideous broke broke up, I had there was a time frame where between Empire Hideous and the Misfits, uh, I had gotten a call from D. D. Verney, who's in a band called Overkill, and he had actually uh, no, that's wrong. I actually got a call from his guitar player Jack Frost, who was in this side project with D. D. Uh, called the Bronx Casket Company. Jack called me up, said, uh, Dee Dee is interested in having you sing um, for this project called the Bronx Casket Company. Um, and it sounded intriguing. They let me hear a, a demo that, that Dee Dee had, had played. And um, I, I, I said, you know, what the hell? It was a paying gig. I, I, I knew Overkill. I knew Dee Dee. I knew who he was. And um, it was just something that I thought I'd take on. When I started recording the music, I was really taken by it, and it, it's very powerful, uh, very powerful type of music. Uh, I, you know, recorded the album, the first album with uh, the band, and um, I figured, you know, this is this is a pretty good outlet. It's different, you know, and. Uh, Actually, before that even happened, is you know the the Misfit thing happened. Then I came out of the Misfits, and then we did the first album. Um, at the same time, Spy Society was going on. Uh, so it, it's it's a cross between the, the three bands. Uh, they just uh, the three <laughs> bands just kind of merged to like not merged, but the 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 creation and the. The happenings of all of them just meshed into like at one point in time between '98 and '99, you know. And you have to stop now. <laughs> you know? um, 
Yeah, the, the predictions of Nostradamus were always, um, I was always fascinated by that. And I, I used to write a lot about what, what would happen if the world were to come to an end or, or America would uh, be attacked. And, uh, basically, that's what happened in 9-11. A lot of my, my writing um, and music was, um, it was just about you know, how the world would end and how we would, we would suffer. I think we're already there. Uh, needless to say, getting back to my friend who had mentioned uh, the Empire is defining this this hit on America. Um, he's also said to me, uh, you know, "There's no better time than the present to come back." And you guys had foreseen uh, New York City being attacked. And that's that's exactly what I saw. I think rarely on at this point, but mainly uh, he, he said that it was it was something that it was a prophecy that I had written through music, nor whatever he is of MTV. It's like some preppy guy who uh, I guess his main goal is to make money. I can't really necessarily. I'm not blaming the guy for anything, but. I just don't understand MTV anymore. I think I think they should change the name. It's not uh, it's not a music video station anymore. It's primarily all this rap um, rap new metal rap crap. It's bunch of, it's a bunch of crap. Is what it is. It's just I can't stand watching MTV. I think it's a, it's a, it's annoying. It's annoying to see all the talk shows, all the real, real world um, TV shows. Um, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I think I, every time I turn it on, there's some video, on, not even a video, it's a talk show. But uh, when I do see a video, it's 90% of the time it's rap. And I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I, I hate rap. I, I don't like rap at all. Um, but it seems to be the end thing right now. Mm. Yeah, it's just my opinion, but I think rap lost its balls. Uh, it doesn't really have a meaning anymore. Years ago, in the late '80s, rap was it, it had uh, something to say. It had um, it had a message for the black community. Now, you can't tell me that Eminem has a message for the black community. Or Kid Rock has a message for the black community, and they're doing rap, and that's all this popular music. I don't get it. I'm completely confused. And yet all these guys are making millions of dollars, and me, I'm piss broke. <laughs> I don't get it. I, I really don't understand what, what rap is all about right now. Maybe I'm just ignorant to it all, you know, it's all going on. But MTV glorified it. You know, all these rap bands around, the rap bands, they're not even bands, they're just a bunch of guys who get up behind a microphone and, like, speak. They don't even sing. It's, it, how could it be a band? The definition of a band is a unit of men or women together playing instruments, creating music. Now, you know, I try to be cultural uh, in, in in a lot of different things, and I'll, as soon as I see, if I flip through the channels and I see a rap thing going on, I'll watch it and I'll try to figure out what's going on, and you know, appreciate it for what it is. But the fact of the matter is, uh, what does it take to do rap music? It doesn't really take much of anything, quite frankly. It, uh, you know, I could do rap. I could do rap music. With two arms and my legs tied behind my back. It, it's so simple. It's so simple. It is such a sellout at this point, you know, that I don't even, I, I wonder if like even the black community and, you know, those involved in, uh, in rap music even understand what's happened. It's in commercials. I mean, Jesus Christ, Pop-Tarts uses a rap in their commercials. Um, you know, car commercials, uh, like Kool-Aid. What? The, come on! I mean, these are kids' things, and they're they're rap is just supposed to be this bad met, like this bad bad boy kind of uh, uh, music from the from the suburbs, you know, from the urban uh, uh, part of uh, our society and culture. 
and then they incorporated it into like children's uh, viewing television. I don't get it. It's it's just it's just not right anymore. It, I, it, rap has lost all its uh, its meaning as far as I'm concerned. You know, I could appreciate what it was years and years ago, and it it, uh, it provided a a message from the black community. But now I don't think it uh, it it does nothing for me. I really don't even care about rap. And as far as MTV is concerned, I think MTV is just primarily concerned about making money, which you know is pretty obvious. Everybody wants to make money, but when it comes down to it, MTV, they'll never play my video. All right, there it is. With the kitty on the left. Um, did you get it still shot? Of the <coughs> in the book? So we get the pictures? Yeah, take yeah. a picture of it. After I got out of the, out of the Misfits um, in 98, I started writing a book um, in September of 98. And uh, <coughs> basically what I, I decided I... I felt I had enough information uh, from going on tour and running my own band for 10 years that um, I had enough information that I could write something that would be interesting to people such as myself who are in the music industry on their way traveling you know, the, the path to uh, their own success. And um, I started writing in 98 and it took me it took me about two years, technically, to, to finish it. Um, now, let me, let me scratch that. It, it actually took me a year. I gave myself a year to write the whole thing. Um, and in one year, I completed it. Even though I had completed it, though, uh, once it was edited, I rewrote it a, a numerous amount of times. Um, I think there was about ten rewrites to the entire book. Um, so then that was another year of rewrites. Uh, finally, by the end of the second year into the third year, it was pretty much done, and um, it uh, it finally got out in the third year. The contents of the book, uh, what it's all about, is um, it's basically my view on um, on the music industry as an independent musician uh, from start <coughs> from the start of my career. Uh, with Empire Hideous, through uh, the success with with um, the Misfits, out of that, and then back to square one again. So it's basically a rags to riches to rags story, um, and explaining how I went from uh, you know nothing, not knowing how to write music, not knowing how to do anything with music, play an instrument, um, book a show, or anything to playing to, you know, 13,000 people in Sweden. To coming back out of that and not having a job, not having uh, a place to live, um, not having a band, not having anything that would really, um, you know, not, not having a life that was prior to the Misfits uh, for me. I was basically... Uh, I was basically, uh, I had nothing, and uh, like I said, rags to riches to rags again, and I started all over, and I'm still doing it, and I started Empire Hideous again, and uh, the book, the book touches a lot about Empire Hideous in the first, I, I think the first six chapters, <coughs> and um, you know, there's three chapters dedicated, uh, after that, there's three chapters dedicated to the, my involvement with the Misfits, and um, a chapter after that which uh, describes my, my aftermath of, of the Misfits and then starting over again. Uh, I find it to be, uh, I, I find it to be a, something I'm very proud of right now. Uh, it took me as long as it did, you know. All the information came from, most of it, not all of it, but m most of the information came from the journals that I've kept since I was 18. Um, so the information, the, the everything that's logged in here, 
dates, locations, names. Um, they're all accurate because they're all taken from my journals. Um, there's photographs, there's over 40 pictures in here. Um, and it's finally... <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> Where was I? Oh yeah. Okay. Come on, bro. Yeah. <laughs> a minute. Hang on. All right. Focus. Focus, guys. Hopper. The book. <laughs> the book. What did I say? What was I saying? You were talking about being hungry. Well, Pictures. Uh, you were d describing what was inside the book. The pictures that you had in there. Pictures, right. Yeah. <laughs> Action! <laughs> Alright. <clears throat> There's over 40 pictures in the book. Uh, it touches on every angle of my life as a musician uh, and everything that went, th uh, everything I went through from the beginning of Empire Hideous up until today. And, um,. It's something, like I said, it's something I'm very proud of right now. I'm really, I'm really excited. I just, I just hope everybody else will, will enjoy it. I think um, uh, a few, the few people that have, have spoken to me about reading it say that it's a good read. Um, they find it to be an easy read, um, where uh, things that are described, it, it's, it's, it's easy to understand. It's not a complicated book. Um, I don't find myself to be a, an intricate author, an intricate writer. Uh, my experience in writing came from being interviewed as you know, as, as a singer for the Empire Hideous, and also from uh, writing for uh, a music newspaper in Jersey that um, I used to have my own column for. So I got my experience for like six years in writing. Never went to college or anything like that. In fact, I even failed English in high school. <laughs> So uh, I think it's an easy read, I really do. And I think that the people that have, um, have cr uh, read it and reviewed it um, have, have said what I would say about it, it being a book that you can just pick up and read from cover to cover in you know, a few days. I, I know somebody who, I know two people who read it in one day. I don't know, it took me a couple of months, <laughs> as far as rank was concerned. And uh, it, the, the book describes my experiences and my emotion levels and how they were going up and down due to the fact of how I felt I was treated um, by the band members. Uh, things just changed after a couple of weeks, just being with them, living on four bus with them for, <coughs> for about 40 days. And it did change dramatically and affected me emotionally and mentally. Um, I was very unstable after a while because I really didn't have anybody to talk to. Everybody was all somebody new that I had met. And, you know, without going into too much detail and you know, taking away from the book, it was very difficult, and then the breakup, eventually when the breakup occurred, I was devastated. Uh, I felt that I had, uh, I felt that I had gone through something that changed my life, and at the same time, uh, once um, they, f you know, they had their, their fill of me, and they were done using me, they just let me loose, and they cut me loose. And that hurt a lot. It was really, really devastating. It affected me. I couldn't even begin to tell you how it affected me. It, was, it just really affected me bad. Very badly. And again, the book really, it, the book goes into more detail about how and why and where and what and um, uh, I think uh, if it wasn't for the, the writing of the journals in my book, that uh, I would probably have gone insane. It really, really helped me a lot writing the, the journal. Uh, it kept, 
kept me sane. I kept, I would write things down and how I felt at the moment um, while on tour, um, you know, something upset me. Eventually, going back and reading that and then writing it to, to the book really made me see that it, it was definitely a, a, a good outlet. I was heartbroken. This was uh, asked me to leave. Yeah. So I go to it's hanging on my wall. Actually, I'm selling that. What are you going? What's going for? Uh, I was asking 1500, but uh, I'm willing to negotiate. Uh, I have this for you. Oh, right. Oops. I just ripped it in half. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's somewhere, somewhere. Now it's worth even more money. <laughs> oh, wow. This would have been nice. Stundal end up playing? No, they got canceled, too. Yeah, what a, what a shame. This would have been a great show. Too bad. Come on, Jeremy. Actually. They're doing a... Ron Jeremy, oh, they're doing some documentary on like porn. On uh, I don't know what the <laughs> hell. <laughs> these are like these are new. These are ten dollars pop. What are they? Um, I eight. Digitally, I only oh, digital, digital. To the top there. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, because you, I saw you flip that thing open and then it. Bang. Oh, yeah, okay. I'll, show you, I'll show you some of the footage. You I want. got one just like that. Only mine's not digitally. It's a high eight. The height's good too. Can you play over Stephanie, around? Stephanie, right? Yes. Can you flip these lights off for me? Sure. These white switches <laughs> so they don't burn out. Come on, Chris, don't be grabbing up all the. Uh... Can you see? Yeah, well, she just turned up. A, a counter for. There's like a, across the hall, there's, a, there's an, uh, a yoga loft now, but it used to be a printing uh, local mm -hmm. company. And they, this was in there. It's fucking heavy as shit. <laughs> the hand truck? You're kidding me. Oh my god. You should, <laughs> I was like, I had it on my back at one point. And I'm like crawling through the door because oh it's god. so tall. It's like, set, it's yeah. gotta be seven feet high. It wouldn't fit through the door, so I had to like bend it down and I'm always on my knees and pulling <laughs> this thing through. Thank you. I love that thing. <laughs> yeah, I had a party here in October, and you know, you know the band, the Brickbats, or the Brides. Are? I, I can imagine. It. They broke my handcuffs. I see that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I scolded them for that. Just interesting position with the bar right there. Just I had a lot of aggression when I had my punching bag up on that thing. Pitcher on it. <laughs> That's great. That's where this pin comes from. I hate women. Not all women are bad. Uh, all women are bad. bad. Hey, all the crap song that song. I'm not saying they're all bad. I just say I hate them all. You know what it is? I had. I had the hell was that? Ninety percent of the time, they would always hook up with me because of like who I was. Yeah. Your name. Yeah. Yeah. And it really pissed me off. And like my girlfriend, the one that broke, she used to live right next door. And when we broke up, she stayed living next door for a year, and it was the worst year I'm of my sure. life. Sure. Yeah, that's what, yeah, exactly. It's like seeing someone that you work with. That's just ridiculous. I just don't think office romance works at all. Not at all. Had that. Oh, I see Rob Zombie. Um, do you know when his movie's coming out? Poor Rob has been talking about his movie for. <laughs> I know what's going. Because at first they told him it was too violent Wait. for. Uh, we saw him at Ozfest, and he was like, oh, we'll be out in October. He's telling everybody, and we're uh, waiting around, and, and mm -hmm. we're just waiting around, and nothing. Yeah. Nothing at all. <laughs> you got to let me know now which one of these pictures you're going to put in, because uh, some of them are... Can you update it? If you don't put my hey, email address? Excuse me one second. If you want to take one of those out for a good shot, you can take it out of the plastic. You won't get that glare. Yeah, I got an angle, so I'm not getting a glare. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Say again. Um... For, for your website, when, when you update it, if you can put my email address for the video thing. Absolutely. We'll give you credit, every credit you deserve. Well, if you need to contact me, it's very easy. It's Mike Hideous at AOL. Okay. I, I don't give that to, like, the public to just, like, email me, fan mail, or anything like that. You know? Hey, there's Ozzy. You got Ozzy. Do you, 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 you I am? Yeah. Uh -huh. right there. Um, 
you know, uh, uh, I'll call you. I, I'm not going to try to, I'm not trying, I'm going to try not to call you. It's you know a good picture. No, 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 it's all right. I mean, if you got to contact me, you got to contact me. Like I said, your best way to get in touch with me is, is through the AOL account. Okay, very good. This is a good picture. I heard about it, you know? Um, they did Final Damnation. It was on DVD of your company. So that you have access to go where you want to. So I'm going to have a security. Are team. you going to have the, the laminates? We have, well, we have our own hideous laminates. Uh, uh, if I have an extra one, I'll you know, get one. I can get you maybe one or two, but I can't guarantee it. Yes. If that doesn't work, I mean, you can always just wear like a name tag. Yeah, because I'm afraid they're going to let me with the cameras. No, they'll let you in. You, it's my show. Some midnight? Some mm, no. Is there anything that you can I do? have other stuff. Like two minutes to midnight, I don't have um, on anything. Aren't you guys going to be sharing what you have? <laughs> yeah, but why don't we get home and look at it? <laughs> I'm Mike Hideous. I'm from a band called The Empire Hideous. Uh, I started Empire Hideous back in 1988. Um, uh, just basically, I had no idea what I was doing. I started writing music uh, with a friend of mine, and eventually, before I knew it, band picked up, and we were doing club shows and recording records and CDs and tapes and doing videos and all that. Uh, Empire Hideous has been, it's, it's been quoted as being um, an apocalyptic band. Uh, the music that I've written about over the years and the lyrics that I write always have to do with the end of the world or the coming of the end of the world or Nostradamus's predictions and prophecies. The song Logic is actually a song written about drugs. Um, some people, yeah, yeah, a lot of people didn't really know that. Uh, some people think it's a political thing, but it's actually, it's, um, it's about drugs. It's about um, experimenting with drugs and the effects that they, they can have on you. And this is called Logic. i 
Jason Triaxa. Triaxa.